Hello, good, happy Wednesday morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, wherever you are in the world. This is Doug Farrar of Touchdown Wire and the US Today, USA Today Sports Media Group. And the guy over there is Greg Cosell in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, in the NFL Films head offices. Greg of NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup, which, of course, we all DVR and watch every week. And, Greg, we have four weeks in the season. And before we get into the games, which are very interesting this week, um, this is not your first rodeo. You've been with film since 1949. <laughs> so when you're four weeks in, how much do you start to see and mark trends in your analysis? And when does that really, like, when you really start to see repeatable patterns? Is it four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? Like, yeah, is this, it's a great, is this it's where a you great start question. to kind of see things work? Yeah. I think it's different for different teams, depending on who the coach is. But you definitely start to see things where you say, oh, yeah, they do that. Um you know, and, and I think, you know, for someone like me, that that's very comforting because those first those early weeks, you know, I'm taking such detailed notes because you just don't know what a team's staples are. You know, right. because, as you know, Doug, when, it's, when the schedule comes out, teams start preparing, certainly for the first game in great detail, but really for the first two, three, four games, because it's not just, you know, the coaching staff. They've got other people, scouts, you know personnel people who do this kind of work as well. So everybody starts to prepare for early in the season, and particularly when they know coaches, when coaches have a track record. Because one thing I learned early from a veteran coach who'd been in the league years and years and years is he's told me that coaches coach against coaches. Right. And, and you know, certain coaches clearly have track records. If they've been doing it for 30 years, you know, if you play against – and he's not coaching now, but, you know, if you play against Rex Ryan, for instance – you kind of know what you're going to get. You know, yeah. he's not going to dramatically change everything that he'd done in his career, you know. And that's true of a lot of coaches who are veteran coaches on both sides of the ball, particularly the play callers. Um, but, yes, you definitely start to see trends. Uh, you also start to see some younger coaches who've, who've learned, and, you know, mm -hmm. we'll probably get to one uh, in our conversation today, who I think is doing an outstanding job, and he's young and he's evolving. And young coaches, you'd like you like to see that because they learn from what works, what doesn't work, how to best use their personnel. All young coaches come in with a philosophy based on where they've been, but sometimes that philosophy may not fit the personnel they have, so they have to grow and expand. Yep. Well, let's uh, let's start the games with, and this <laughs> this looks a lot more interesting than it did when the schedule came out. Rams Eagles, and uh -huh. uh, oh, it, there's a whole lot of stuff to discuss here. Um, real quick, it, 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 we don't, it's Wednesday. We don't know if Cooper cup is going to return from injury, but if he does, we discussed this on the phone and you brought up a, a really inter interesting point about this. If Cooper cup comes back and with Puka Nakua and Tua, Tutu Atwell doing their things, how does that possibly affect what they're doing in the passing game? It's a fascinating question. It's a bit of an unknown. Um, and the reason let's assume he's in, let's assume he's full go. Yeah. See, so now I'm really curious to see how that works because Nakua, who's obviously been targeted a ton, I think 50 times in four games and with 39 catches, um, he's been playing Cooper Cup's position. Mm -hmm. He's been the Z receiver. So he pretty much, you know, nothing's 100%, but he pretty much aligns with Higby on the same side. Now we know that they do a ton of reduced splits. One of the things that's been so much fun to watch with them this year is – I think they've increased the amount of motion that they do from recent years. They did a lot of motion when they had Robert Woods. He was a big motion guy. But the last year or two, for some reason, I don't recall them doing as much as they did earlier. Um, They're doing more motion. And to me, they were more of a two-by-two two team in previous years. They're doing more bunch and stack and things like yes, that. Yes, yes. But they still, the two-by-two two is still a staple, particularly two-by-two sure. two reduced splits. And Nakua has been playing Cup's position. But I think you and I both have tremendous respect for Sean McVay and how smart he is that if Cup is ready to play, he's going to find a way to use him. I mean, it's it's not as if, oh, well, I can't play him because Naku is playing his position. That's right. not going to happen. So yeah. he'll figure out a way to make all that work. I'm not smart enough to know exactly what that's going to be, but he's not going to have a healthy Cooper Cup sitting on the bench. But, yeah. you know, certainly – they're, they've been one of the fun watches for me through four games simply because the way they use motion, 
you know, Tutu Atwell obviously is 150 pounds. You need to create motion with him to get him free access off the ball. And then he's got that great speed to scream at defenders, and that makes it a difficult cover. And, uh, you know, and I just enjoy, and, and this is a personal thing, I guess, but I enjoy watching Matthew Stafford throw a football. I yeah. always have. I think yeah. he's as pretty a thrower as we've seen, and he's still he's still playing at a pretty high level right now. Yeah, he's he's spinning the pillows about his way. Well, let's uh, and this is the kind of stuff I, we like to do on this show. Um, a concept the Rams hit the Colts with twice in the um, in the first half of their overtime win, and it was Van Jefferson running a go to one side. Nakua crosses over at an intermediate crosser. And he's so good at – he's almost like a tight end at how well he exploits those zone voids. And he's they really good at that, yeah. He holds with this twice in the first half. The first time, Kenny Moore, the slot corner, uh, passed his guy off. The second time, Moore blitzed. In the third quarter, they tried it again with Atwell as the crosser and Jefferson as the vert guy. And this time, Moore matched a cross, and he got the interception. So I thought that was interesting how – the Colts were able to, okay, they, it's one of those trend things like, okay, they do this all the time and it's the vert crosser and, and McVay loves that. So I thought it was cool how they sort of adapted, but that those two plays in, and I'll have this up in a film piece uh, today or tomorrow. Um, those indicate to me how well Nakua for a rookie. I mean, we know about the numbers, but just his acumen and his ability to sort of deduce where those voids are in, in zone coverage well i think it's rare for a guy with his experience i mean what 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 i think mcveigh does really really well is with formation and motion he gets to basic concepts that are relatively simple reads for the quarterback mm -hmm. i mean they had a play and they ran it twice and they got to it from different formations and different people in motion i'm sure you remember the play where nakua went in motion uh from the left side of the formation to the right, and then released inside the tight end. Yes. And he ended up catching a crosser. All that was was a high-low concept on the hook defender uh, to the side in which he ran the crosser. Um, he took two receivers to the side that Nakua initially was on, and they simply ran clear routes. Atwell ran a, a, a wheel, and I believe it was Jefferson – uh, who ran a vertical and they just cleared out because when you play the Colts, you know, you're going to get cover three. Sure. That's Gus Bradley. That's they know that. And it ended up just being a different way to get to a basic high low concept. And they did it again on the first play of overtime in which Nakua caught a 20 yarder. And it was the exact same concept yep. gotten to in a totally different way. Nakua was not the motion man on this one, but the concept of the play was exactly the same. So all it is, is it, all they do is it, it's a high low and mm -hmm. high low are, uh, they're very common, but, and they're pretty basic reads for the quarterback, but they do such a good job with how they get to basic concepts. And that uh, overtime touchdown was also looked like a blown coverage where Kenny Moore was talking to Julius Brents like, no, we're in man. You got to cover him. And yeah, it was a bunch and they and they screwed yeah. it up. Yeah. Not, not a good thing when two guys are on one and man, you sort of want your guy on your guy. <laughs> yeah, both both Moore and Brents played point man Hopkins, leaving Nakua free on his inbreaker. Yep. That's what happened. Whoops. So the Eagles have played cover three on 43 opponent attempts this season, which ranks eighth highest in the league. They've allowed 33 completions for 304 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and a pass rating of 111. Hmm. Um, in general, I mean, we know about the front, uh, you know, with, uh, with Job in there and kind of new safeties. And I know uh, Blankenship's played really well. How do the Eagles array? I mean, we know they have the edge with the fronts, but in their coverage concepts. Yeah. How do they sort of attack this? Well, they are a little uncomfortable with their coverage because they signed Bradley Roby, and yep. we don't know, you know, whether he plays this weekend. You know, that's unknown as you and I talk on a Wednesday. Right. Um, but they're obviously a little uncomfortable because James Bradbury has been playing in the slot, and he's not really a slot. Uh, and in yep. this game, you know, it, to, to have someone who's not really comfortable with where he's playing, with what the Rams do, you don't want that. No. You know, and Roby – ended up in the last number, couple of years in New Orleans playing the slot a good amount. That's what he did. So, you know, I think they would probably want to put Bradbury back outside, although I don't think Josh Job has played poorly. But again, they're just not – he's a he's he's in a second year, Job, but he's essentially a rookie. And, uh, you know, Bradbury out of position. So uh, because you need – when you play the Rams, 
it, there's a pretty significant mental part of the game for your secondary as well mm -hmm. because of all the motions, all the tight splits, um, all the stacks, the bunches. You know, it's not just, you know, let's line up and play. And uh, even if you choose to play man, there's still issues at times with the stacks and the bunches. So because there's multiple ways to play bunch. But, um, you know, so we'll see how it plays out. But, yes, you're right. They certainly have the advantage with their defensive front, which they'll have against, you know, 90 percent of the teams in the league. Yeah. Um, although it's funny watching the tape this week. And again, he could be awful this week if he has to play again. But I actually thought Joseph Noteboom in a left tackle had a really good game in pass yeah. protection against the Colts. Uh, but like I said, you know, he could certainly get eaten up by Josh Sweat. You know, for their talent, they're they're really playing well. Um, but it, it's shot the the move from Jonathan Gannon to Sean Desai. I think they're not they're still not blitzing a lot. They don't need to. Right. But Desai has been really creative with his blitzes. Nicholas Morrow had three sacks against the Commanders. I know you know this, and I know you've watched all three plays. First was on an A-gap blitz. Second, luckily, he was spying Sam Howell and kind of cleaned it up after Fletcher Cox almost got there. And the third was a late blitz that Washington just did not pick up right up the middle. And he had right. a <laughs> Right. So it, it, you know, again, with Desai, they're more interesting in their blitz concepts, and that's a an additional issue for that Rams offensive line. Yes, like and the now, other thing. Now do you have to bring in extra guys to protect, and how does that minimize what you can do in the yeah, past? and he's just more aggressive overall with how he pressures because their stunt percentage has also gone way up from a yep. year ago. So he's just more aggressive, Doug, with how he wants to pressure. You know, he's not just lining up and let's rush the quarterback. And obviously he has good players and they could do that and probably be relatively successful. They did have 70 sacks a year ago and they were not a heavy stunt team at all. In fact, I think they were in the bottom third in the NFL in stunt percentage. They're not this year. You see a lot more stunts. And as you said, there's been more pressures. Um, and a lot of times, even though Morrow ended up with three sacks, a lot of times pressures are designed to dictate one-on-ones for your better pass rushers. So even if you pressure with Nick Morrow, um, the goal is not for Nick Morrow necessarily to get the sack. The goal might be to create a one-on-one -on -one for a Josh Sweat or for a Jalen Carter, you know, because ultimately it's a matchup league. And, and when you have better players, you want them one-on-one. -on -one. The Titans, yeah. for instance, are very, very good at that. You yeah. know, they want to get – um, Jeffrey Simmons, Danico Autry, they want to get those guys one on one with an offensive guard or an offensive center because they believe they can win those one on one matchups. Yep. Uh, Dan Campbell was talking about a sack of Lee McNeil had last Sunday, where, or last Thursday, excuse me, where uh, the, it was set up for Aiden Hutchinson to get it, but McNeil just blew up the Packers' left guard and he got there first. So it's like, well, okay, we don't care who gets there as long as somebody gets there. It's just, it's, it's fine. Uh, the weekly question, Greg, where are we with Jalen Hurts? <clears throat> well, I thought Jalen Hurts played much better this week. Um, you know, I thought he was more decisive with his throws. Um, he's he's obviously still very, very accurate on deep balls, which he was a year ago, and he was in this game. And obviously the Eagles felt that they could go after Emmanuel Forbes, who plays in the nickel for the commanders, and he's the boundary corner, so they knew where he would be. Um and they obviously set up A.J. Brown on him a number of times, and uh, Brown obviously beat him. Um, and and uh, Jalen made some really good vertical throws. So I thought in this game he was better overall. The key to me was he was more decisive. I felt like he saw it quicker, and he was more decisive. And if you notice this year – the running element to him has not really been a big factor through four weeks. No, they're running the ball more traditionally. It's less of a QB run thing, a lot less. Yeah, than and even his scrambles, he's not scrambling as much. I know he had one big one in this game, but for the most part, he's not really scrambling, scrambling a lot. No, it's not designed. I mean, he might scramble out of pressure, obviously, because they're quarterback. Yeah. Does. It's not as nearly as designed because last year it was just like, wow. Um so Jaguars Bills, the uh, London game this week, six thirty in the morning Pacific time. Thanks a lot for those of us on the West Coast. Yikes! Um, so we discussed in the matchup preview for this game how the Bills needed to put color into his head. To you know, they, they did they did so many good things, which their defense can do. It's a zone heavy team with brilliant disciplined players. The sim pressures, the stunts the way uh, they handed things off on Micah Hyde's interception. 
And I don't want to minimize what they did on defense, but in this first quarter, when the game was like 14, 14 and you know, all that, the bills went too high on four snaps in the second half. When things started to get out of hand, they went too high on 10 snaps in the second half. It was 18 snaps. And Mike McDaniel said after the game that, yeah, we probably abandoned the run too early, but they kind of didn't have a choice. So they were playing Miami was playing one handed and they were so good with the run against the Broncos in that 70 to 20 game. So everything worked for the bills and just your thoughts on how the bills dialed it up. Because I know we were talking yesterday and you said, and I agree, they didn't do anything revolutionary. They didn't do anything we haven't seen before. No, And I think they did everything so well. Yeah. I mean, it, what was interesting was they actually rushed five on the first two plays of the game and they probably not probably, they obviously did that intentionally to show Tua and, and Miami something, you know, that to get in their head and say, hey, maybe we're going to come a little bit. And then obviously they didn't play that way as the game progressed. Um, but that was actually pretty smart. I mean, look, Tua had 41 dropbacks in the game and the Bills rushed four or less on 37 of the 41 dropbacks. So this was a game built around their defensive line, which, by the way, played at a very, very high level. And Daquan yes. Jones may have played the best game of his career. Um, and they played zone coverage predominantly. You know, they didn't, they played man here and there, but they predominantly played zone. The interesting thing about this game for me watching it is the Bills, the best way to play the Dolphins was essentially what the Bills did, but that's the way the Bills play pretty much anyway. So they didn't have to change up how they play in order to play the Dolphins. Now they played with unbelievably great discipline. That to me really stood out in their zone concepts. Um, you know, the interesting thing watching the tape is you you kept seeing because Jordan Poyer did not play and Taylor Rapp, who is an experienced player, but obviously Poyer and Hyde have been together for a long time. But it, before so many of the plays, you could see Hyde communicating with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And because Hyde, you know, he's such a smart player, has been in the league a long time. And and he just, you know, obviously – he, not that I'm not going to sit here and say he knew the plays, but I mean, they just, he was able to get everybody on the same page on every play. And, you know, Milano is so, so good. Not only is he super aggressive, but he's super disciplined. Mm -hmm. And I thought in their zone concepts, they understood the routes. They understood where they were coming from and where they were going. Yes. And they did such a good job of matching routes and then passing on routes. Yes. So, well, it didn't, yeah, that, so it yeah. didn't show open to Tua in his initial drop. Now, Tua made a couple of really good throws and really good plays. Obviously, you're not going to shut that offense out. No. Um, but they didn't – you know, I watched the tape because I knew that everybody this week would ask me about it. And I'm watching the tape, and, I, you know, I actually watched it first thing Tuesday morning because I'm really sharp. You know, I'm a morning person, and, when, and I get in the office at 530, and I'm just raring to go. And I watched that tape, and I'm halfway through, and I'm thinking, boy, there's nothing really revolutionary here. Like, when people ask me, I'm not going to say, oh, they did something I've never seen before, you know. But that's the way they play normally. So they didn't have to step outside what they do. They just had to do it at a really, really high level and and, and be aware of certain things, and, and they were. And their D-line really, really played well. That's important. You need yeah. to be able to rush four. I mean, essentially they played split safety and rushed four. I know I'm simplifying, but that's the way you have to play the uh, Dolphins. You have to play with split safety and, and have your four-man rush be a factor. That was the skeleton, and then within that, and you talked about knowing where the routes were. They they passed off the sim pressures so well with yes. That. You would think it was this guy and this guy over here. Nope, they're dropping because we know he's going over here. And the Hyde interception uh, that was uh, they had a four man pressure with cover two on the back end. Hyde they were playing cover two. It was yeah. it was basically cover two. Now I don't know if Tua didn't read it as cover two, uh, but obviously that throw was not available. Um, well, yeah, Hayden Johnson dropped to match the front side vertical routes run by Devon A. Chain and uh, Robbie Chosen. And then Bernard replaced Johnson to take Chosen up to Hyde with Johnson taking Alec Ingle underneath. Tua's first read was to his backside. Milano had Hill just enough to take that away. And Tua wasn't going to try Durham Smythe way outside because it wasn't really there. So he turned his focus to the other side. And by then they had it figured out. I and mean, he just really didn't have a lot of places to go. Yeah, I mean – 
you know, again, it was a classic case. I don't know if he didn't read the coverage correctly because you're 100 percent right. He wanted to throw the seam to chosen with timing and, and conviction and it wasn't there. Nope. And, you know, I don't know, maybe he believed that by looking opposite the throw, it would move people. But they were playing cover, too. So Bernard was the middle hole defender, um, you know, and. You know, he's he's going to be there. I mean, he's not going to move. You know, he's not going to react to Tua. He's going to play his responsibility, which, by the way, he played it perfectly. And therefore, the throw wasn't there. And he had to lift the throw and he just overthrew it. And there was there was hype. Yeah. And Bernard, who became a starter this year after Edmonds went to Chicago, uh, probably a bad move. (laughs) Uh, he, He has really become a glue guy in that defense. So let's spin it forward to the Jaguars passing game. How much, I don't know how much Trevor Lawrence you've watched this season. I mean, it's not like he's played badly, but just my notes, he looks off mechanically. He's missing simple stuff on his first reads. His lower and upper body aren't in sync at times. When working from a muddied pocket, he seems to speed up his process too quickly. Will spray the ball too often. Looks like he's trying to finesse it, and the ball placement isn't consistent. Not all his fault. Drops have been an issue. There are another team struggling in the red zone at times. We'll talk more about that when we get to the Cowboys. But this is something to watch against a defense that is, I mean, this might be the best defense in the league right now with the Bills. Yeah, and you know what? It's 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 a classic case, though, that every week we we overdo teams that play great. Now, the Bills ha- are a good defense, and Sean McDermott is clearly a, a big-time defensive coach. And obviously, this team can score because if you look at the last four years, they average 30 points a game every year. So, I mean, we're talking about a good team. Right. Um, but again, you know, I don't want to get caught up in why well, the Bills are the best team in the league and now they're going to win every single game. You know, I, I, oh, no. yeah, um, I'm not crowning them per se. Just no, no. And I know you're not. But, you know, that's what, you know, after the look, after the Dolphins scored 70, it was, you know, oh my God, we've never seen anything like this. And obviously that performance, we hadn't seen anything like it in the NFL. And obviously what the Bills did, both defensively and offensively, was very, very impressive. And, uh, you know, and the fact is, the last four years, I mean, I looked up the numbers. I think Josh Allen, since he became a full-time starter in his second year, I think the Bills are 50 and 19. So, I mean, they win a lot of games and they score a lot of points. You know, that's just the reality. (laughs) They're good. Um, But, you know, certainly Trevor Lawrence, you know, I think that offense has sputtered a bit up and down. Um, But Lawrence is still a good quarterback. You know, I haven't watched them. I'm just, I'm I'm basing. Yeah, I haven't watched them enough. And I'll be honest. Like, it just seems a little off. Yeah, I haven't watched them enough to, to – so I have to study them a little more maybe later this week. So, I, you know, again, I don't want to say anything only right. because I, I could be wrong. But but they do have good players. The, the run game hasn't gotten going much at all. I think they expected – and it's not – you know, run games are not necessarily the back's fault, so I'm not going to say, boy, ATN's playing badly. But yeah. the point is they have not been able to generate any kind of sustaining consistency – with the run game and there's been no explosive play, or, or I shouldn't say no I think there's been one but there there haven't been explosive plays the way you would like to see from an explosive back like ATN well I'll be interested to see down the road what you think of how Lawrence has done like I said it's not a disaster it's just interesting for a quarterback of his caliber so speaking of teams struggling in the red zone Greg <laughs> Cowboys 49ers when you're facing the 49ers defense, this is not a time to be struggling in the red zone. But the Cowboys have 19 red zone drives this season, the most in the NFL. They have converted seven of those drives for touchdowns. That conversion rate of 36 points. That's not good. It's the third worst in the league behind the Saints in Texas. And the Texas thing surprised you because that's actually a good offense. Uh, there was run, one red zone handoff to Tony Pollard against the Patriots where Dak Prescott and Pollard ran into each other. That was a four-yard loss. There was another play where they had four receivers to the right, so it was kind of a diamond formation. There weren't really any rubs and picks to take advantage of coverage. They're struggling to get pushed in the run game in compressed areas. The passing concepts don't seem to tune to create designed openings. They're doing a lot of things short of the sticks, so to speak. And I know you you and I discussed this this morning, and you you brought that up as well. Um, I'm not going to say – this isn't a bash Mike McCarthy thing, but what are the most common concepts to get guys well, – in that in the high red zone, especially yeah. against a very disciplined 49ers defense. Yeah, there's, I don't, I don't there's want to crap on the Cowboys. I just want to get into how you can fix it. I think that I think you have to talk about the multiple ways in which you play in the red zone. There's different concepts from the 11 yard line to the 20 yard line, and different concepts from the one yard line to the 10 yard line. You know, obviously 11 to 20 we call the high red zone. The one to 10 we call the low red zone. Obviously, when you're in, from the 11 yard line to the 20 yard line, there's more space. So when there's more space, 
you can do more with route concepts. And that's where spacing becomes really important. They've not been very good at that. Um, no. You know, and the timing of their route combinations has has kind of been off a little bit. And I don't think people realize how that impacts the quarterback. Everybody just says, oh, Dak's no good. But that really, really impacts the quarterback, Doug. And it makes it much harder for the quarterback. So, you know, this is not necessarily a Dak Prescott issue, even though everything falls on him. Um, receivers have been too close together. You know, a lot of teams like to throw fades in, in the red zone, both high red zone and low red zone. You have to decide if you're a big believer in that, and you have to decide who your receivers are and if they're fade ball receivers. Um, I'm not sure the Cowboys, you know, they, they've thrown fades. I, I'm not a big believer in fades, but that's a personal thing. That doesn't make me right. I'm just not a big believer in that. I don't think it's a particularly high percentage throw, and unless you have one of those kinds of receivers, and I'm not sure, as much as I like C.D. Lamb, I'm not sure they have one of those guys. Um then when you get in the lower red zone, you know, you the, the space decreases significantly. So you need to find ways with your route concepts to displace defenders, whether yes. it's with rubs, whether it's with picks, whether it's it's the nature of the route you run. Um, you need to displace them because there's not a lot of space and, and the quarterback doesn't have time. You know, you can't go through a whole reading progression. You don't have that kind of time and you don't have that kind of space. And then, of course, there's the run game in the low red zone. You know, I remember, you know, I'm going back a long way and people will remember this. You know, the Cowboys of the early 90s would get in the low red zone and all they would do is hand it off to Emmett. You know, Troy Aikman never threw for a ton of touchdowns because I don't think he ever threw any red zone touchdowns because they would hand it to Emmett because they would move people off the ball. They, they haven't been able to do that. So they don't really have a run game in the low red zone. Yeah. So now you get stuck, you know. And then, of course, there's... I don't want to say gimmick plays and trick plays, but you have to be creative at times in the low red zone. It's hard to score there, you know, unless you're physically better and can move people and run it. If you can't, you have to get creative. I mean, yeah, they're not really in that position right now. They're not going to overwhelm you with Jimmy's and Joe's, so to speak. Right. So you have to, you know, you have to do creative things and, and, you know, whether you want to call them gimmicks or, you know, I, I prefer to say it, be creative you know i mean we see andy reed do that all the time we're seeing more teams do it and that may be an area in which they have to you know start doing things you have to then get creative if your base stuff is not being effective for whatever reason you know to me the worst thing i i want to hear a coach say and no knock on any coach you know i'm just i'm someone who just sits and watches tape and i know how important it is in the overall scheme of, of, of just doing your job and the player's job but I just don't like when a coach says we have to execute better. You know, of course, execution's built into anything you do. But, you know, if it's not working, then let's let's try to scheme it up a little better. And, you know, sometimes you just have to try to be creative. Reminds me of the uh, famous John McKay quote when he was a Buccaneers head coach. If someone asked I'm all him, for it. Yeah. What do you thought of the team's ex- execution? I'm all for it. Uh, yeah. So yeah. One, uh, one quick hit. Uh, Jets Broncos. What the Jets did for Zach Wilson in that game, I thought, I mean, he, you know, a lot more pre-snap motion, a lot more play action. But Wilson played, and I was kind of shocked, beyond scheme, three really nice tight window explosive throws. I know you yeah. watched What did you think of him just overall? Um, well, the first thing I thought, because prior to this game, you, you almost felt like he didn't belong on an NFL field. Right. And I'm not saying that to be sarcastic. Nope. I mean, it just didn't look like he belonged. He belonged in the game. You can read progressions. I mean, you can't do that. Yeah. I, look, I'll tell you, here's something I thought that people probably don't think about that I thought he did exceptionally well, particularly through the early part of the game. And this stuff is so important. I thought he executed the basics. And one area in which he did that is he threw checkdowns. He yeah. understood when to check it down and he did it at the right time. And that might not seem like a big deal to people, you know, when a guy throws to the back on a checkdown, but that's quarterbacking. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, sometimes you got to do that. That's just understanding, hey, I'm not seeing it. It's not exactly the way, you know, my primary is not there. It's not working. Hey, let me go to my check down. Let me move the sticks. Let me play quarterback, you know. And I thought through the early part of the game, you saw that. 
And I mm-hmm. thought that that was really, really good because too many times, what did we see with Zach Wilson in the past? He dropped back and clearly he wasn't seeing it. And you could almost see with his body language that there was a sense of panic in him. Yep. And, and you know, what, what, what happens with quarterbacks, and I've used this term before, but I think people can vividly see it. When you're playing slow mentally, okay, in other words, when you're not seeing it, so when you're slow mentally, the result is you play fast physically because you know you only have two 2.5 seconds. So if you're just not registering what you're you're supposed to register or process and you're slow doing that, you go, oh, my God, I only have two seconds. Now I better do something else. And you Uh just kind of get out of there. And that's the way he was playing. And in this game, he wasn't like that. Yep. You know, and I thought this was a step again. I think his his game against Denver is a really big. I'm not saying it's career defining, but if he continues to play that way against Denver, and Denver has its own set of issues on defense, as we know, but if he continues to play that way against Denver, then you have to start to think, hey, maybe this guy can really be an NFL quarterback. Because Doug, you and I both know the talent traits are clearly oh, there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I mean, Tom Brady, who I think we can agree is the greatest quarterback of all time, never struggled to take a profit. If it's good enough for Brady, it's good enough for you. Yeah. Me. I mean, I know that's the old cliche, you know, you don't yeah. go broke by taking a profit, but I mean, it's true the point it's is, a because it works. It's true. Yeah. The point is, is there's nothing wrong. If you don't, if, if you don't get a clear picture for whatever reason, defense takes it away. You're just uncertain. There's nothing wrong with taking the check down, particularly at the right time. And that's the key. You know, yep. some guys wait, 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 and they check it down. And it's way too late. And the defense reacts and you gain one yard. You know, there's there's a, a timing to a check down as well. And I thought he had a good sense of when to throw the check down. Yeah, real quick uh, to end it. And I don't know how much Broncos defense you've watched. I haven't had time to really study it yet. But the cratering of that defense, they have the worst DVOA through four games in the history of DVOA, which goes back to 1981. How much of that have you watched and, and what have you been able um, to see? I think I I certainly saw them against Miami. I saw them against Sam Howell. I did not see them yet this week against Justin Fields. That's one of my next watches, Justin yeah. Fields. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, you know, they're obviously they're not very good right now. Yeah, we knew they were light <laughs> on the front. I think we kind of expected that, but the coverage confusions are yeah. confusing. Let's put it that Which way. Which is surprising. Vance Joseph is a veteran NFL D coordinator, yeah. and you know. I think the assumption was that after the Miami game, they'd fix a lot of things. Uh, And like I said, I have not watched Justin Fields, but I know that, you know, his numbers were outstanding. And just from what I saw on TV, he looked more comfortable throwing the ball as well. You know, allowed 16 straight completions in the first half to two straight quarterbacks to uh, Justin Fields. That's that's (laughs) really not a good stat for a defense, is it? That's less than optimal, Greg. Well, uh, Always more than optimal is the great, great coach selling X's and O's. Uh, we have some things to kick down the road for uh, next week and beyond, and we'll be back to talk more X's and O's then. Thanks, Doug.